It's 1961. Let's go shopping for a cheap, small computer. The popular choice is this, an IBM 1401. Complete with a punch card reader and printer, it weighs about a ton and costs about three and a half million dollars in 2024 money. If that's a little too much, you could always try out one of these, PDP-1, at 730 kilos and a touch over a million dollars in 2024 money. There are other options available, but none weigh less than a grand piano, and all cost more than a mansion. That's because every digital computer in production at the moment comprises of individual or discrete transistors. These must be installed individually into circuit boards, which are connected into logic units to form a processor. Collectively, these draw a lot of power, create a lot of heat, require a lot of room, and require a lot of time to assemble. Now let's skip forward just 10 years to late 1971. You, a member of the public, can order one of these for just $450 in 2024 money. This is a fully functional processor on a chip. A microprocessor. It's several orders of magnitude smaller and cheaper than the mainframes of the early 1960s. Quite an astounding change in just a decade. As far as almost everyone on Earth is concerned, this is the first chip scale processor ever developed. Now let's skip forward another 27 years to 1998. A paper from 1971 is quietly declassified. It turns out there was another microprocessor in existence more than a year before the 4004 was released. It was called the MP944. In fact, it was significantly more advanced than the 4004, boasting some features that weren't seen in consumer microprocessors until the 1980s. Why was this pivotal piece of computing history kept secret for more than 25 years? Because the MP944 was the air data computer for the US Navy's flagship fighter jet. The F-14 Tomcat. The airplane has the computer-controlled swing-wing concept, which gives it a great advantage as far as being a good dogfighter is concerned. Okay, back to the present day. Every video I've made in the past has been about something I'd known about for years. This one's a bit different. It was suggested by a viewer. Now, I've covered similar topics, but I'd barely heard of the MP944 until a few months ago, and reading up on it has been fascinating. It was created by a team of about 25 engineers at Garrett Air Research over the course of two years. The designers of the chips themselves were Steve Geller and Ray Holt, someone whose name will crop up repeatedly in this video, as Ray is very much active even today. Before we go into the details, just a quick couple of points. As with all my videos, this is arranged into chapters, so feel free to skip ahead if a particular section isn't of interest. I do tend to go into quite a lot of depth on the technical details. Similarly, I'll make reference to some of my previous videos, but they by no means essential viewing, and this video is very much standalone. And finally, we all make mistakes. Unfortunately, YouTube doesn't allow me to make minor corrections once a video is published. So if I get anything wrong, do let me know in the comments. However, I will add any known corrections to a pinned comment. I ask that you check this first before posting. For clarity, MP944 refers to the collection of chips. These chips were integrated together to form a computer known as the Central Air Data Computer, or CADC. So, the MP944 was the microprocessor, the CADC was the computer. Let's take a step back and discuss the F-14. I've stirred up controversy in the past by saying this. Most modern supersonic aircraft are inherently unstable. That's the reason most of them look really ugly. 14-year-old me would be extremely angry if he heard me saying that. 
So let me clarify what I meant there. If you're like 98% of my audience, you're a man. Go and find the nearest woman or child and ask them what's the best looking of these aircraft. They'll usually pick the one that isn't big, scary, and pointy. Years ago, I helped out at an air show. I was showing visitors around the RAF trainer aircraft, one of these. A very quick interjection from future Alex here. Um, I was never actually in the military. I was in a glorified version of the cadets when I was at university. Um, I don't want anyone thinking I'm one of those weirdos that pretends they were in the military when they weren't. Okay, back to the video. We were parked right next to a tornado fighter, and we assumed no one would care about our tiny little propeller plane. We were wrong. We were totally inundated with kids who wanted to sit in the actual plane, not the weird-looking jet next to it. So that's what I say when I mean ugly. Fighter aircraft are most certainly not designed to look good. But a side effect is they tend to look really intimidating. And the most intimidating looking fighter ever built has to be the F-14. Designed to replace the F-4 as the US Navy's main carrier aircraft, it served until 2006 for the US military. In fact, some are still in service with the Iranian Air Force today, but that's something we'll come back to later. Now, I can't really talk about this jet without mentioning one of the reasons it's famous. <sighs> it was in Top Gun. You know, the film about volleyball. Now, I'm going to stir up more controversy here. I don't understand why that film was so popular. I'll, I'll just leave it there and I'll not mention Top Gun again. Anyway, one of the reasons it's so distinctive is also the reason it needed a flight computer. Variable wing geometry also known as swing wings. Every time I try and discuss supersonic aerodynamics, I get something wrong, so we'll keep it really simple this time. When flying at low speed, for example on approach to landing, we want as much lift as possible to maintain stable flight. This is when the F-14 would swing its wings forward into what I like to call the T-pose. However, this creates a high aspect ratio, which creates more drag. So if we want to go fast, we go from a T-pose into what I call the Naruto run configuration. Now, jokes aside, improvements in aerodynamic computation and design in recent decades have rendered variable wing geometry obsolete. But these were all the rage in the 1960s and 70s. With the computer enabled, the wing position was set automatically with no pilot input. This ensured the aircraft was in the appropriate configuration for the given speed and altitude. Furthermore, it reduced task loading on the pilot and reduced the chance of the configuration being changed during the wrong phase of flight. In a previous video, I heavily criticised Virgin Galactic for not using a flight computer to actuate the rotating wing on Spaceship 2. In fact, that was the cause of a fatal accident in 2014. It's nice to know the F-14 was able to autonomously change its wing geometry via a computer more than 40 years before Spaceship 2 first flew. Earlier similar aircraft such as the F-111 were notoriously difficult to control during the transition from one wing configuration to another. Though I should note, the F-111 was an excellent aircraft with an excellent combat record. But it's not difficult to imagine why this transition was a challenge. Swinging the wings completely altered the flight characteristics of the aircraft in a few seconds. And this may be carried out whilst flying at transonic speeds, where flight characteristics are already unpredictable. I'd always imagined the F-14 would require straight and level flight, and a lot of care to transition from one configuration to the other. And I was completely wrong. There are videos of it sweeping the wings back and forward while inverted, mid-manoeuvre, in steep banks, Think of an attitude, and there's probably a video of an F-14 actively sweeping its wings back while in that attitude somewhere. As most of these videos are from air shows, the pilot manually overrode the computer to select the wing position. But the movement itself was still controlled by the computer to ensure stable flight was maintained. When the wings were swept back, this posed another problem, and I've discussed this previously on this channel. Those large lifting surfaces moving backwards move the centre of pressure backwards too. Normally this is a good thing. We want the centre of pressure to remain behind the centre of gravity as this maintains stable flight in the longitudinal axis. 
But in this case, it was too far back, reducing the maneuverability of the aircraft. Not something you want in an aircraft designed for dogfighting. So, there were small surfaces that could be extended from the front of the wings. These were known as glove vanes. Again, it wouldn't be desirable just to extend these at a fixed rate, as they could radically alter the aircraft's handling quickly. So the computer also controlled the extension and retraction of the glove vanes. Later in the F-14's life, these tended to be disabled altogether due to their mechanical complexity but the computer had always been designed to control them if needed. The final mechanical output controlled by the CADC was the manoeuvring flaps. The primary control surfaces for rolling were the tailorons and wing spoilers, though the latter could only be employed at low speed. However, by partially extending the flaps, the F-14 was able to enter a tighter roll than would otherwise be possible. If the flaps were set to manoeuvring mode, the CADC actuated them automatically to meet the pilot's inputs. So physically, the CADC was required to actuate some of the F-14's secondary control surfaces, namely the variable wings, the glove vanes and the manoeuvring flaps. Not quite a full fly-by-wire aircraft, but the CADC did act as a fly-by-wire computer for these surfaces. But it wasn't called the central partial fly-by-wire computer. So what about the data in CADC? Anyone who's flown a light aircraft will be familiar with the mechanical instruments, which are able to convert air pressure and temperature to readings such as airspeed and altitude. At high airspeed and altitudes, however, this is surprisingly difficult. Due to factors such as the compressibility of air and changing Mach limit with temperature, the formula to determine speed and altitude become non-linear so a simple mechanical indicator is no longer sufficient. Supersonic aircraft of the 1960s, such as the F-4, used complex mechanical computers to provide flight data to the pilot. The CADC, however, was the first microprocessor-based flight computer to achieve this. Specifically, it provided altitude, temperature and airspeed to the pilot, and probably some other metrics that I can't find references to. And this leads us on to the final function of the CADC. It provided necessary data to the weapons system. The F-14 had a particularly advanced weapon system for the time, able to track and target multiple airborne targets simultaneously. Six simultaneously, to be specific. Prior to firing air-to-air -air missiles, the state vector of the missile was passed to the weapon system. A crucial metric was the angle of attack of the aircraft as this would determine the initial attitude corrections necessary for the missile after firing. The needs of the weapon system also give insight into the requirement for a 20-bit data length. The required resolution for the altimeter was just one foot. Smart bombs didn't exist yet, so to line up for a bombing run, the speed and altitude of the aircraft were used to predict the ballistic trajectory of a bomb, providing the pilot with an optimised time to release. In fact, the aircraft was flown on altitude hold during a bombing run. With a service ceiling of around 50,000 feet, which by the way is already a 16-bit number, high altitude runs could foreseeably take place in rarefied air, where the difference in pressure between altitudes was minimal, hence the need for that 20-bit precision. The term microprocessor was barely used during the early 1970s. It was largely retroactively applied to all the devices we'll discuss today. Ironically, it's not a common term today either. What was called a microprocessor in the past is now generally referred to as a CPU. More specialised hardware such as GPUs and FPGAs would probably also fall under the definition of microprocessor. So what is a microprocessor? There's no official definition as such, so let's just go with Wikipedia. That states, quote, A microprocessor is a computer processor where the data processing logic and control is included on a single integrated circuit, or a small number of integrated circuits. And with that, we immediately run into an ambiguity. A small number of integrated circuits. What exactly is a small number? And for that matter, does something that can only input and operate on one bit count as a microprocessor? 
do the logic elements all have to be on one chip? The Intel 4004 is most commonly cited as the first microprocessor. It was part of a four-chip collection referred to as the MCS4. We'll be exploring the 4004 in more depth later. However, Intel's claim as that being the first microprocessor is far from solid. In fact, Intel themselves refer to it as the first commercially available microprocessor. Let's compare it with the MP944. I'll warn you, we're going to be seriously splitting some hairs for the next couple of minutes. That's because there seems to be quite heated debate online as to what the first microprocessor actually was, so it's important that we get our definitions clear. Okay, so which came first? There's no contest here. The MP944 chipset was completed in June 1970. The first 4004 was produced in January 1971, with the first sales of the finished product to the public in November 1971. Now let's look at capability, briefly. We'll do a whole chapter on capability later. The MP944 could perform logic and arithmetic operations on 20-bit numbers. The first bit was used to denote a negative or positive number, so this means the processor could natively handle integers between negative and positive 524,288. It's always possible to handle numbers outside of this range, but that requires significantly more compute time and coding as we have to deal with overflow logic and store and process the intermediate results. The 4004, that could handle just 4 bits, meaning it could natively handle numbers between 0 and 15. That's really not much. Now, this was enough to build a calculator if we assign a 4-bit value for every integer in a number, but even that required significantly more code than an 8-bit or higher processor. You couldn't, for example, build a practical desktop computer with a 4-bit processor. Now, this is the first of many controversial statements I'm going to make during this video, but I reckon there's even a debate to be had as to whether a 4-bit system is complex enough to even be called a microprocessor. For the record, I think it still counts, but it's not really the same thing as something like a 6502, or a Z80, which were popular consumer products about a decade later. Okay, now the big one, the number of integrated circuits. The biggest common strike against the MP944's claim to first microprocessor is the fact it consisted of six distinct ICs, and some people insist that a microprocessor can only consist of one IC. Now, of course, there's a lot of nuance to this, Two of these are the ROM and the RAM, so we can discard those as being part of the actual microprocessor. Or can we? We'll come back to that. The next two ICs are essentially specialised coprocessors, the parallel divide unit and the parallel multiply unit. These do exactly one thing. They take two numbers and either multiply or divide them. Now, perhaps we require the presence of these two chips for the system as a whole to work, no, we don't. This often overlooked sentence from Holt's 1971 paper clarified, quote, Each unit was designed to operate as a separate entity and could be used without the need of any other unit. End quote. That is really interesting. In theory, any chip from the system as a whole is able to operate by itself. So how many do we need to form a full-blown microprocessor? The final two chips are the steering logic unit and the CPU. Now, in theory, you could feed in a sequence of pulses into the appropriate pins of the CPU to provide it with data and instructions, and you'd receive outputs. But in reality, we need something to manage our various inputs and feed them into the CPU. And that is the SLU. For now, we can think of this as an I.O. interface between the outside world and the CPU. It's not really part of the CPU, it just translates inputs into a form that the CPU can use. So, the CPU can, in theory, operate by itself. Is that an unambiguous case of a microprocessor on a single integrated circuit? Unfortunately, no. The CPU can perform various logic functions, but it can't add or subtract. Wait, really? Yeah. 
The MP944 did addition and subtraction on the SLU chips. This sounds unusual, but it actually provided a major benefit, as we'll see later. But that means a minimum of two integrated circuits were required. Let's swing back the other way. Not quite. The CPU could perform a variety of logic functions, and it could also perform conditional branching. I'm almost certain that makes it Turing complete. So while it couldn't add numbers directly, it could do so indirectly, making it a viable yet highly impractical single chip microprocessor. Except we swing back the other way again. The CPU was missing something else. It didn't contain a program counter. This is a register found in all standard CPUs, which keeps track of our current memory location, also known as our current place in the program. The program counter for the MP944 was in the ROM? Yeah. So, while it would be theoretically possible to use the CPU chip by itself to perform logic and arithmetic, to actually run a program and do something useful, we'd need a ROM chip, an SLU chip, and a CPU chip. Okay, so for the absolute purists who insist a microprocessor must consist of a single integrated circuit, the MP944 loses to the 4004, right? Wrong. It turns out the 4004 couldn't operate as a single chip either. As with the MP944 CPU, the 4004 needed a separate I.O. chip to function. In order to get the logic functionality onto a single silicon die, the 4004 required extensive simplification. One of the simplified elements was the data decoding. It wasn't possible to hook up the necessary 12 address pins and 8 instruction pins, so a shift register chip was necessary in order to transfer the data in and out of the CPU. Similar, but less advanced than the SLU used in the MP944. That got complicated quickly, so I'd better throw a final spanner in the works. There's another entirely separate contender. The four-phase CPU is almost impossible to find meaningful information on, but several hundred were sold in the early 1970s. In terms of complexity, it sat somewhere between the 4004 and the MP944. Unlike the former two, the logic functions of the CPU itself were split between three chips. However, it was claimed that one of these could function in isolation as a dedicated 8-bit CPU. However, again, there is a lot of controversy here, including a court case and allegations of deception which honestly appear to be quite valid. If we drop the strict requirement that a microprocessor must be on a single chip and include the MP944, it feels like we should probably include the four phase as well, even though it's more split up as such than the MP944. That said, it's probably easier to disqualify it from the title of first based on date. The four phase system was unambiguously completed in October 1970 when the first sales were made. Recall the first unambiguous date for the MP944 was June 1970, when it was accepted by the Navy. Of course, there's some ambiguity regarding earlier iterations of both designs. The four-phase system looks fascinating, but there's so little information available on it, it'd require researching and producing an entirely separate video. So, what was the first microprocessor? I, I don't think it matters. The definition is arbitrary, ambiguous, and outdated. Personally, if you forced me to take a side, I'd refer to the MP944 as a microprocessor, and probably the first one at that. You may disagree, and that's fine. But the one thing we can probably all agree on is that the MP944 was incredibly advanced for its time. Let's find out exactly how advanced it was. Carrying out any technical contract for the US military carries a blessing in the form of practically unlimited potential for funding. It also carries the curse of stringent requirements, and there were many requirements for the CADC project. The first was the requirement to operate at mil-spec temperatures. 
negative 55 to positive 125 degrees centigrade specifically. Now, that's not entirely outside the realms of possibility for consumer-based hardware today, but imagine building the world's first microprocessor only to integrate it into a computer that was capable of running in a sauna. Pretty impressive. Another requirement which had the potential to shelve the whole project was failure analysis. Every engineer learns about time-based failure prediction. Components tend to fail after a mean amount of time in use, otherwise known as mean time between failure. And depending on how they are used, we can get a good idea on how failures are distributed around this mean. If one component fails, we can often predict how long it'll be before associated parts fail. It's not difficult to imagine the military putting huge focus on these failure metrics. Weapon systems cost a lot of money in both capital and maintenance, and they perform life and death critical functions. So I can only imagine the mounting horror felt by the US Navy's representative late into the project when the CADC team sat him down and explained failure metrics didn't exist for the computer. It was a brand new system with no operational history and nothing analogous to compare it to. Fortunately, an excellent workaround was devised. Rather than predicting failure based on past data, with something like a microprocessor, it's possible to diagnose failure in real time. After all, a microprocessor and its associated memory is really just a collection of transistors. So by writing programs that execute instructions that use every transistor at some point, and then comparing the output with the expected output, a single transistor failure could, in theory, be detected. Through some clever coding, Ray was able to devise self-diagnostic programs that tested every transistor on four of the six chips. And that includes the ROM and the RAM, by the way. The parallel multiplier and divider chips were checked for 98% of failure cases, with the remaining 2% being non-critical for flight. These self-diagnostic checks were carried out as part of the main program loop, if a failure occurred, the pilot would know about it within one eighteenth of a second, and a second, completely redundant computer was automatically activated and the pilot notified by a light in the cockpit. So about that one eighteenth of a second number. To calculate the flight characteristics, the CADC was required to perform about 600 calculations every one eighteenth of a second. And when I say calculations, I don't just mean integer operations. I mean full calculations. The most common was a sixth order polynomial, like this. However, to obtain a solution, the formula was rearranged into this form. And that required a lot of multiplications. A multiplication takes a while on a conventional CPU. The MP944 had a clock speed of 375kHz, so this would give an average of only 35 instructions per calculation. And that's if we assume one instruction per clock cycle, which, as we'll see, is a very weak assumption. With such a low clock speed, it'd be flat out impossible for a conventional CPU of the day to perform so many calculations so quickly. So now, we'll take a dive into the architecture of the MP944, which completely set it apart from anything else that existed at the time. We've already seen the six different integrated circuits that make up the MP944. Let's walk through what each did in detail, and how they were integrated to form a working computer. Ray's paper actually discusses a number of potential configurations, but we'll look at the one configuration they were actually used for, the F14 CADC. In essence, the job of the CADC was to take digital inputs from a number of sensors and turn those into usable outputs. Of course, to process these inputs, a series of instructions were required. In other words, a program. The MP944 microprocessor was a modified Harvard architecture, with the program and variables residing in separate memory. The program was in the ROM, which was the first of the six ICs. In the CADC, multiple ROM chips were used to store the entire program, Overall control was provided by the system executive ROM, with lesser ROM units supplying instructions to individual compute units. 
As mentioned, the program counter was housed in the ROM. This is unusual, but was a deliberate choice to reduce the number of traces on the board, since none of the compute units needed to be able to communicate the program location to the ROM. Therefore, this made best use of the available physical space. I imagine this would have also made the system more difficult to program, but as we'll come back to, that wasn't really a problem since it needed to be programmed once and once only for its intended purpose. Outputs consisted of both direct digital signals and values written to the second of the ICs, the RAM. As with any conventional computer, the RAM contents could be read as variables for subsequent program instructions, or they could be output as and when necessary. So, how did the computer get from ROM instructions and digital inputs to stored results in RAM and digital outputs? I'm going to work backwards. As we'd expect, there was a CPU. In this case, it was known as the Special Logic Function, or SLF, though I'm just going to refer to it as the CPU for ease of understanding. Now, I can't show the exact architecture for the CPU, as it's never been publicly disclosed. But here's what we know about it. Like any CPU, it consisted of a number of registers and an arithmetic logic unit, or ALU. Values were stored in the registers, and basic arithmetic was performed on these values using the ALU. This gave an output. And as with most early CPUs, the ALU was capable of basic logical operations. However, this chip differed from a conventional CPU in several aspects. First of all, it was specialised for one particular operation, the limit function. This is a basic operation shown on screen here. It simply clamps a given input between upper and lower bounding values. This function was required so frequently in the flight calculations that the IC was optimised to perform it. One register was designated for each of the bounding values, with a third being used for the input. When the limit operation was performed, the correct register was chosen as the output. I'm not exactly sure how other logical operations were performed, but I imagine the two inputs were stored in two of the registers, with a third used as an accumulator, which is a special register to which the ALU can write and read from directly. The second unconventional design choice was the number of pins. Typically values are passed in and out of a CPU in parallel. In this context, that means one pin per input and output bit. Remember, the MP944 had a 20-bit architecture, so when I discuss values, I'm referring to 20-bit numbers. Conventionally, this would require 20 pins for the input and 20 for the output. And of course, some additional pins would also be needed for power, clock, synchronization, ground, reset, and testing. This wasn't really feasible in this case. One of the design constraints from the Navy was for the system to fit on a 40 square inch board. That's just 15 by 15 centimetres. Bear in mind, the Apollo guidance computer first flew just four years before the CADC was completed and was considered an absolute miracle of miniaturization. It weighed 30 kilos and was 60 by 30 by 15 centimeters. So the CADC team designed the entire system to operate serially. Inputs and outputs formed a sequence broadcast via single pins. The lower pin count, however, came with the penalty of longer transfer times between compute and memory as each 20-bit value now required 20 clock cycles to move from one place to another. It's also a complete headache to understand, and it must have been a nightmare to program. To generate serial inputs for the CPU, a dedicated I.O. chip was necessary. This was the data steering unit. Recall the I.O. chip necessary to use the Intel 4004? This was so much more than that. It accepted inputs from either digital sensors or from the RAM or ROM and steered these inputs to where they were needed. If I understand correctly, each SLU accepted up to 13 inputs and could provide serial data to three outputs. Through the use of appropriate commands, 
the necessary inputs could be sent to the CPU. However, as mentioned, this chip also had the capability to add and subtract. Data wasn't just steered from input to output. Two inputs could be added or subtracted as they were being shifted. Performing the operation during data transfer allowed for fast addition. In fact, due to some clever design, the SLU could actually add three numbers at the same time. You could see how the data was serially shifted through the unit and steered to the required output here. Though, bear in mind, I'm showing only 8-bit numbers and 5 inputs. In reality, 20-bit numbers were steered from 13 inputs. In the case of the CADC, each data steering unit only made use of a single output, but other configurations were possible, including using the output from one steering unit as the input to another steering unit. Quick side note, if you can add, you can also subtract. It's done by converting the binary representation of a number to its 2's complement. The MP944 generally operated on 2's complement, but we're not going to go into further details on that here. So, what we have here now is a complete module, able to read instructions and data, steer necessary data to a CPU, and use that CPU to perform calculations, outputting the results to RAM or directly. But we're not done yet. What really set the MP944 apart from other processors were the parallel units. Today we'd refer to these as coprocessors. There were two, a parallel multiplier and a parallel divider. Let's focus on the parallel multiplier, as I think that one's a little easier to understand. Functions such as the sixth order polynomial I mentioned earlier require a lot of multiplication, and fast. Early CPUs were pretty terrible at multiplication, because they couldn't do it. Well, not directly anyway. When it comes to multiplication, the only useful arithmetic instructions available in most CPUs from the 1970s were addition and bit shifting. One way of multiplying x by y was to add x to itself y times. Of course, for a 20-bit number, that would take practically forever. The more conventional approach was to use long multiplication, just as we teach at elementary school. Here, we take x, multiply it by each bit of y, and add the partial products. But hold on, I just said we can't multiply. Turns out we don't need to. Since we're dealing with binary only, the partial products can be defined conditionally. Every partial product is either x or 0, because we only ever multiply by 1 or 0. However, this still takes a long time, especially for 20-bit numbers. So, the next approach is to use a specialised algorithm for multiplication, in this case, Booth's algorithm. I was going to explain exactly how this works, but that would take a while, so I've linked an excellent video instead. I'm showing an implementation on screen now, though, for a couple of 4-bit numbers. Now, it's possible to implement Booth's algorithm on a simple CPU. However, without specialised hardware, it still takes ages. So, let's make a more specialised arithmetic logic unit that can perform Booth's algorithm in hardware. It takes x and y and automatically executes the algorithm, sending the result to a third register. In fact, if we smart, we could send x and y to this special ALU, and while we're waiting for the result, we could perform other simpler operations on our first ALU, and we could do addition in the SLU at the same time. We don't need to let a lengthy multiplication operation lock up our entire process if we run it in parallel. And that is the fundamental concept that allowed the designers of the CADC to claw back time lost to serially moving data. They used parallelization. In reality, this second ALU and its associated registers were housed in a separate dedicated chip, the parallel multiplier. In fact, parallelization wasn't the only time-saving innovation here. That time taken to shift the result of the output register, the next input could be shifted in at the same time. This approach of overlapping one operation with the next is known as pipelining, and the MP944 
was the first microprocessor to do that too. All the chips I've discussed so far were capable of simultaneously shifting data in and out in this manner. And as mentioned, there was also a parallel divider unit. Basically the same as the parallel multiplier, but for division. Now, I must stress, both of these parallel units were particularly complex for the time, just on their own. Incorporating them into a fully working system was really quite spectacular. And with that, we have the full architecture. Multiple duplicates of some of the chips were used in the implementation for the CADC, forming distinct compute units, each controlled by their own ROM and SL, and outputting to dedicated RAM. According to the 1971 paper, this was the configuration used by the CADC. In total, there were one of each of the CPU, PDU, and PMU chips, three steering units, three RAM units, and 19 ROM chips. In my video about the Apollo Guidance Computer fly-by-wire system, to which I've already made several references, we discussed at length how complex software engineering was used to tackle many of the problems. The Apollo Guidance Computer itself was a reasonably general purpose machine. In some ways the CADC was the opposite. Difficult problems tended to be solved in hardware rather than software. Any computer executes its code as machine code, strings of digital inputs represented by binary words. In the case of the Apollo Guidance Computer, a compiler was written which allowed programs to be written in assembly language which is more human readable. This was then converted to binary by the compiler for execution. In fact, the Apollo Guidance Computer team also created a higher level language for more complex subroutines and they were able to simulate more specialised hardware by using what were essentially virtual machines. The special purpose ALU's parallel processors and other hardware in the MP944 performed these more specialised tasks without the need for either highly complex subroutines or simulating more complex hardware in code. The trade-off was there was no compiler. Due to time constraints, all coding was performed in just three months. This isn't necessarily as bad as it sounds. Remember the CADC in which the MP944 was used was application specific. It was designed to do one thing and one thing only. On the other hand, the team decided they didn't have the time to write a compiler. The entire program was written not in assembly, but in binary machine code. The final program was over 60,000 bits in length or about 3,000 instructions. As was the case with the Apollo Guidance Computer, it wasn't possible to continuously develop and test code snippets on the actual hardware. The ROMs to which the code would be written required at least several weeks to manufacture, so it was all or nothing. The entire code base was to be burned to the ROM and run in one go. Coding up the ROMs had the additional complexity of there not being a single monolithic program, Looking at the system architecture, each data steering unit to compute unit combination required its own set of instructions. So an overall program control ROM, or program executive, was necessary to orchestrate all of the individual modules. And when I say module, I'm referring to both software and hardware, actually. So individual ROM chips required their own standalone code. Of course, coding this all in one go is infeasible. No one can write 3,000 instructions correctly without a single mistake. So a means of simulating the hardware to test out code before final manufacture was required. Ray's brother, Bill, was actually pulled into the project to solve this. He created a simulator for the MP944 in Fortran. I've not been able to figure out exactly what this simulator looked like, but I presume it ran on an IBM mainframe, or something similar. Crucially, it emulated every transistor in the MP944 chips, and so allowed Ray and the team to test subroutines without having to create dedicated ROM chips. The second solution was the creation of a physical simulator. 
Using discrete components, a mock-up of the MP944 was built to function test the hardware itself. Of course, due to the larger scale, it would have run much slower than the chips, but it was sufficient to prove functionality before the actual chips were manufactured. The code was delivered to the manufacturers on punched paper tape. Floppy drives didn't exist yet, so this was the only practical means of doing so. When the manufactured ROM chips were received a few weeks later, they worked almost flawlessly. A single bit out of a total of more than 60,000 was incorrect, requiring remanufacture. But honestly, that's about as good a result as anyone can ask for. The corrected ROMs were delivered a few weeks later, and the completed project was handed over to the Navy for evaluation in June 1970. We've spoken extensively about what the MP944 chipset could do. Unfortunately, I can't get my hands on an F14, so instead, let's take a look at the Intel 4004 for comparison. We'll see it was severely lacking in functionality alongside the MP944. That said, I want to make clear that the 4004 was still a remarkable achievement for the time. Mass producing and selling it at an affordable price required a number of technological breakthroughs. It also required some significant compromises. I have one here. In order to use it, I've built a retro shield, which is an open source board available here on GitHub. It allows an Arduino to simulate the RAM, ROM, and I.O. chip. So in theory, I can write a program in 4004 assembly and upload it to the Arduino to be run on the 4004. Unfortunately, the documentation and code for the retro shield is a bit lacking or incomplete, so I'll just show it running here. If anyone wants a more detailed video on the 4004 in the future, I'm happy to get it all figured out, so just let me know in the comments, but it'll take me a while. The first major compromise was, of course, the 4-bit data and address bus. As I've already mentioned, the 4004 could only count to 15. This does mean it was able to handle a single digit per instruction, which leads us on to its primary use case, a calculator. The 4004 was specifically designed to be the CPU for the Busicom 141PF calculator. It's not very exciting, is it? In fact, the RetroShield repo includes the code to emulate the calculator, but it doesn't seem to work for me. The 4004 did see a few other uses, including most notably in pinball machines, but it was just too simple a CPU to be used for anything beyond this, really. That 4-bit data bus simplified the chip design, but it complicated programming. 4004 instructions were at minimum 8 bits in length, and the chip could address 12 bits of memory. So how do we get these instructions and addresses in and out of the 4-bit buses? The answer is to serialize them. Unlike most microprocessors where instructions are fed in a single clock cycle, the 4004 required them to be broken up. Here's how. The 4004 requires two independent clock signals with a max clock speed of 740 kHz. They must be provided in the pattern shown here. The chip will then respond with a sync pulse every eight cycles as shown. This pulse denotes the start of a full execution cycle. The required memory address to read from or write to must be split into three 4-bit words and provided during the first three clock cycles. Then the instruction to execute must be provided during the next two. The final three cycles are used to actually execute the instruction. Of course, the shift register chip would handle much of the splitting up and passing of instructions to the CPU. Although the clock speed was 740 kHz, the need for 8 cycles to actually execute anything limited the CPU to 92,600 instructions per second, as there was no capability for pipelining or parallel processing. We should of course note that the MP944 also accepted an output data in serial. But, as we've already discussed, the extensive design decisions that were made negated the time penalty for doing so. A real plus for the 4004 is the registers. 
it has 16 internal 4-bit registers. Honestly, that's probably enough to do useful things without the need for a RAM chip at all. If I put my mind to it, I could probably get this running tic-tac-toe without any RAM, but that's for another time. But where registers are abundant, a stack is not. There is technically a stack on the 4004, but it's just three addresses deep. So you couldn't really use this chip for any recursive operations or nested branching commands. I also noted whilst playing around with the 4004, it doesn't really feel like a microprocessor. It's more akin to programming a microcontroller. And yes, I did verbally mix up the two in my previous video. This is due to the modified Harvard architecture. You have to write your program entirely, save it to ROM, and then execute it. You can't run code from the RAM. In fact, there are only 640 bytes of RAM available. Again, this limitation, if you want to call it that, was also present on the MP944. And that's because the MP944 was designed to do one thing and one thing only. And that brings me to my final point about what is and what isn't a microprocessor. The 4004 and the MP944 were made to perform specific tasks. Directly off the shelf, the 4004 is probably more versatile due to the presence of a compiler and a more general purpose arithmetic logic unit. But the MP944 can perform much more complex operations, much faster, and provide results to many more outputs. Most consumer microprocessors are not application specific and can be manipulated to perform a wide range of tasks. So it would be fair to say the MP944 and the 4004 are both microprocessors, or neither of them are. Either way, as I keep stressing, the MP944 was significantly more complex. The only F-14s remaining in service today are with the Iranian Air Force. How they got there is a story for another day. The Iranians have managed to keep them flying through a combination of ingenuity, determination and presumably pure spite. In fact, some escorted Putin's entourage into the country just a few weeks before I released this video. To prevent spare parts illegally reaching them, the US destroyed its remaining F-14 stock following their retirement in 2006. Ray has a complete set of MP944 chips in his personal collection. As far as I can figure out, these may well be the only remaining examples in existence outside of Iran. Though destroying them feels like a crime against historical preservation, I suppose no one involved in the destruction would have had a clue they were wiping out something of such significance. Through my adult life, I've been through a belief arc that many viewers can probably relate to. I used to believe all military spending was abhorrent and should instead be directed to science, medicine, space exploration, etc. Then I grew up and accepted we're simply not there yet. In recent years, I've come to realise that many of the benefits I tout for funding the sciences are also delivered by the military. A huge proportion of military spending is directed at science, medicine and space exploration. The internet, GPS, encryption technology, the list of everyday benefits that originated as military-backed research is almost endless. So, do we spend too much on defence? I, I don't know. I'm not the person to ask for an opinion on that. The MP944 is not a good example of all the above. It didn't change the world, and it was a metaphorical dead branch on humanity's technological tree. It makes perfect sense that the project was classified. However, looking back more than 50 years later, it seems almost tragic that home computing could have taken quite a different course had the architecture somehow been made public. Back when I made a video about the invention of digital fly-by-wire, I believed there may have only been one computer on Earth at the time capable of performing the job, and that was the Apollo Guidance computer. After producing this video, I now know there were two. I wonder whether there were any more. Thanks very much for watching.